Welcome to Quality Assurance for Community Pharmacies Part 1, leading up to systems analysis of drug incidents. Let's begin with a very brief synopsis of incident analysis. As we recognize that human errors are induced by system failures, we must shift our paradigm from blaming individuals to thoroughly investigating the system itself, which accounts for the majority of underlying problems encountered in community pharmacy. Incident analysis is a tool to assist in the systematic review of drug incidents. Incident analysis seeks to answer three questions in relation to critical incidents. What happened? Why did it happen? And what can be done to reduce the likelihood of recurrence? The concept of incident analysis will be discussed in more detail in part two of this presentation. Now, before delving into how incident analysis can help us in the review of drug incidents, it is important to understand the process for managing and responding to critical incidents as they occur. Part 1 of Quality Assurance for Community Pharmacies focuses on this drug incident management process. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the assistance of ISMP Canada for their contributions in developing this presentation, which includes material from the 2006 Canadian Root Cause Analysis Framework. In this presentation, we will discuss what is a drug incident, adverse drug event, drug error, and how they relate, legal considerations for drug incidents and the process for managing and responding to critical incidents and how this relates to the requirements outlined in the standards for the operation of licensed pharmacies. What is a drug incident? Drug incidents are those events that may cause or lead to inappropriate drug use or patient harm. It is important to understand that drug incidents are preventable. These preventable events may be related to the practice of pharmacists or pharmacy technicians, to drugs, healthcare products, aids and devices, and or to procedures and systems. Drug incidents may be related to prescribing, order communications, product labeling, packaging, nomenclature, compounding, dispensing, distribution, administration, education, monitoring, and use. Note that drug incidents include those events where the drug has been released to the patient. For example, a drug error, as discussed on the next slide, and so-called near misses, where an event has occurred but is caught before the drug has been released to the patient. An adverse drug event, or ADE, is an unexpected and undesired incident that results in an adverse outcome for a patient, including an injury, a complication, or even death. ADEs may be preventable or non-preventable. Non-preventable ADEs are usually related to the pharmacological properties of the drug, for example, an adverse drug reaction and allergies. A drug error is a subset of an adverse drug event that is preventable. With drug errors, the drug is confirmed to have been released to the patient, whereas a drug incident includes both those events in which the mistake is caught prior to the release to the patient and those events where the drug is released to the patient. It is important to note that learning opportunities exist for both scenarios in which mistakes are caught prior to release to the patient and where drugs are released to the patient. The pharmacy team is therefore encouraged to apply incident analysis to drug incidents and to drug errors and ADEs. A brief note on legal considerations. It is important for the pharmacy team to be transparent in all of its dealings with patients, particularly as it relates to drug errors and ADEs. Patients are entitled to know what has gone wrong, and the pharmacist must make every effort to advise the patient and assist them in taking control of their health and well-being. Having said that, it is important to remind all participants that a quality of care review is privileged and confidential, and it is conducted with a view to continual improvement of quality of patient care. Only conclusions should be documented, not the details of discussions or personal comments made by the drug incident review team. And please note, the information provided here is not a substitute for legal advice. All pharmacy staff must proactively develop a plan and understand what needs to be done in the event of an incident. 
While much of this might seem to be common sense, it is not always intuitive to people, and when under stress, people might not be thinking logically. Response to a drug incident should include the following. Any immediate actions necessary, including care of the patient, return of drugs and or health care products, aids and devices to the pharmacy for inspection, securing records and notifying health professionals and caregivers whose care of the patient may be affected, support for staff, disclosure of the incident to the patient, and incident reporting. As mentioned, the immediate actions necessary in response to a drug error include, first and foremost, the care of the patient. Standards 6.5 and 6.7 of the Standards for the Operation of Licensed Pharmacies, herein referred to as SOLP, speak to the necessity to immediately initiate emergency measures to protect the health and safety of the patient, remedy the error by ensuring the patient receives the correct drug, and promptly making changes or take preventative measures in the interests of public safety. Key points in the care of the patient include make the situation safe for the patient. Ask yourself what intervention might be required. Make the situation safe for other patients. Consider if there are any immediate actions required to protect others who may not be aware of the problem. And provide support. When things go wrong, healthcare providers sometimes have a tendency to circle the wagons. This is the time to communicate, communicate, and communicate with the patient and family. Find out who the family wants to be the key contact and provide the patient and or family members with a key person in the pharmacy to contact if they have further questions. As part of the immediate measures in responding to a drug incident, SOLP 6.5E discusses the necessity to ensure return of the incorrect drug to the pharmacy. Having the prescription returned to the pharmacy provides an opportunity for the pharmacy to confirm the error and ensure that no one will inadvertently access the incorrect medication. Often people don't realize that looking at products and devices involved in an error may help in understanding how the error was made. In addition, if devices are involved, it is crucial to ensure they cannot be used again until they have been tested to ensure that they are functioning correctly. Securing records is an important part of drug incident management. It is recommended to keep the prescription hard copy and transaction record with the drug incident report as drug incident documentation must be retained for 10 years. Prescriptions are generally kept for two years past the completion of therapy or for 42 months, whichever is greater. Therefore, if an issue arises in year five and only the drug incident report itself is filed, this means that the prescription hard copy and transaction record may have been shredded. Thus, the prescription hard copy and transaction record should be kept with the drug incident report. Some organizations have the licensee send the original prescription to head office along with an electronic version of the drug error report and only a copy of the drug error report is retained in the pharmacy. This may be done to assist in the resolution of any patient concerns or complaints stemming from the error, assist in the trending of medication errors from both specific pharmacies and regions within the pharmacy chain, and form the basis for implementing chain-wide changes to pharmacy policies and procedures to assist with error reduction. While the practice of sending such information to head office may be a useful organizational policy, there are a couple of considerations that licensees must keep in mind. First, a copy of the prescription and drug incident report must be kept in the pharmacy for reference should the information contained need to be readily accessed. Second, it is important for licensees to understand that as head office receives prescription and drug incident documentation, they are receiving personally identifying health information. By virtue of the Health Information Act, pharmacies as custodians must have a formal agreement in place with their respective head offices to ensure that they comply with the Health Information Act. Custodians, both pharmacies and pharmacists, should enter into agreements with an information manager. For example, head offices of pharmacy chains may be considered 
information managers. By doing so, they may disclose health information to the information manager without the consent of the individuals who are the subjects of the information for the purposes authorized by the agreement. The information manager may use or disclose that information only for the purposes authorized by the agreement. An information manager must comply with the Act, regulations, and the agreement with the custodian. Custodians, both pharmacies and pharmacists, are responsible for ensuring that information managers comply with the Health Information Act by virtue of the formal agreement. Response to a drug incident must involve all health professionals and caregivers whose care for the patient may be affected by the drug error, as per SOLP 6.5C. These individuals play a crucial role in assisting the pharmacist to provide appropriate triage and care for the patient in the event of an adverse drug event where patient harm or injury has occurred. Further, they can be included as part of the quality of care review team to help identify areas of improvement and error prevention strategies. It is very helpful for pharmacies to have a checklist available to indicate who should be notified. And while this might seem like common sense, in an emotionally charged situation, it is helpful for people to have a resource to refer to so that critical individuals are notified in a timely manner. The impact on staff members can in no way be compared to the impact on the patient and family. Nevertheless, staff are well known to be the second victims when incidents occur and often do not get the support they need from coworkers and supervisors. All pharmacy staff should have access to employee assistance programs and critical incident stress debriefing services. Disclosure is a crucial part of the process. Patients have a right to know when an error has occurred and what the potential health consequences might be. From a legal perspective, there are severe consequences when it is later determined that healthcare providers were aware of an error and chose not to disclose this information to the patient. Disclosure to the patient is therefore a requirement as per SOLP 6.5b. The duty to disclose arises out of five ethical principles. Truth-telling. There is an obligation to be honest about drug errors. Autonomy. Patients have a right to know so they can make informed choices. Beneficence. Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians must act in the patient's best interests. Non-malfeasance. Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians must do no harm. This further relates to the responsibility to implement changes or preventative measures to ensure repeat drug errors are avoided, as per SOLP 6.7. Justice. Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians must take responsibility for their respective practices. This quote taken from Justice Gerald Robertson identifies a very simple truth. As pharmacists, we routinely advise our patients of potential benefits and adverse effects that can be associated with drug therapy. They have a right to know how drug therapy can help them, but they also have a right to know about the risks associated with drug therapy so they can make informed decisions about their health. Equally important, then, is for patients to know about any events that have occurred that have the potential to cause them harm or that have caused them harm. Again, this is in the interest of assisting patients in making informed decisions about their health. A study completed by the U.S. Veterans Affairs Administration looked at the overall number and cost of settlements related to malpractice. One facility that adopted an extreme honesty policy had a higher number of claims but lower overall costs. This policy has since been adopted for all Veterans Affairs hospitals. Canadian disclosure guidelines are available to assist practitioners. There are four goals associated with disclosure. Promotion of a clear and consistent approach to disclosing, promotion of interdisciplinary teamwork, facilitation of a patient healthcare professional dialogue that respects and addresses the needs of patients and their families, and fostering learning from adverse events. Here are some final tips on disclosure. How the disclosure is handled is important. Patients need to know that you care about what is happening to them and that steps are being taken to reduce the likelihood that this could happen to someone else. 
Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are strongly encouraged to apply the principles of the Relate Respond Toolkit provided by the Health Quality Council of Alberta. This program gives healthcare providers strategies for establishing rapport with patients and respecting the patient and family's perspective and experience of healthcare when providing information. The underlying premise of Relate Respond is that staff who use these strategies and tools to relate to their patients and clients will be less likely to have to respond to complaints later. The Relate Respond Toolkit can be ordered from HQCA or ask your ACP Pharmacy Practice Consultant. Disclosure is not a one-time occurrence. It is an evolving process that requires ongoing communication with patients and families as information becomes available. It is helpful for patients and families to know that an analysis will be undertaken. How the findings will be shared is often part of this discussion. Performing an analysis and letting the patient and family know builds trust and loyalty. It tells them you care about them and others' health so much that you are willing to take the steps needed to implement preventative measures and improve the quality of patient care. This concludes Part 1 of Quality Assurance for Community Pharmacies. In Part 2, we will discuss in detail the system's approach to investigating drug incidents. Participants will see how incident analysis is a useful tool in the review of drug incidents, allowing for the continual improvement of quality patient care.